Welcome to Finding the Voices. Um, it's been quite some time that I have had an episode and thank you for all your messages asking me, you know, when we are going to have a new episode. And today I want to start with uh, wishing everyone a very, very happy Mother's Day. And on that, I want to give a very special shout, shout out to my mom. And let me share a picture which I posted today. Here it is. So this is a picture of my mom, uh, Ima, giving blessing when I was leaving home a couple of trips ago. Um, generally, we have the tradition of, you know, taking the blessing before leaving home. And I just found this picture to be uh, really awesome. And today morning when I saw this, I said, hey, you know, why not post it for Mother's Day? So thank you, Ima. Uh, my mom is awesome. I just cannot think of my life without her and um, you know her stories um, her sacrifice she has made for uh, me and for my family and for all our siblings uh, I'm truly truly blessed to have a mom uh, like my mother Ima, Ima so don't forget to wish your mom today and um, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers who are watching All right, so today we have a very special guest. Um, it took us some time to coordinate the timing. Our guest is Dr. Sonia Yambam. She's joining us from Brisbane, Australia. And let me pull up a little bit of her bio. All right, and um, I found this um, biography, a little bit detail about Sonia Yambom, and I just wanted to um, share it with all of you. Um, you know, Sonia is a lecturer in physics in um, QUT in um, Brisbane, Australia, and today we are going to learn more about her and then in the second part of our episode, we'll learn about her nominations of gratitude for our 1001 Thagachari. All right, Sonia, so welcome to our show. Thank you. So um, I know a little bit about you, but not so much. Um, I know that you are a very, very kind hearted soul. Of course. Oh, that's uh, very sweet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's how we truly got connected. And we'll talk about that a little bit in one of our break. But uh, I would like to sure. you know, initially start uh, by asking you, requesting you to share a little bit about yourself and, um, you know, your life, your mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I am originally from uh, Manipur, Imphal, and I was born in uh, Kundrakpam, Awanglaikai. And people generally know it by saying Pangai Kundrakpam because it's Pangai is uh, more popular. So I was born as the last daughter of um, Yambem Toiba Singh and uh, Yambem Nganbi Devi. Um, so they both were teachers at the time my uh, father used to be a headmaster now he's retired he's very old now and my mom used to um, work as a lower primary school teacher so i guess like academics uh, being in the academics profession runs in the family and uh, my sisters some of them one of them is a teacher as well and um, eldest one is a nurse and um, the next one is in business uh, second one third one is uh, in teaching the fourth one has also her own business and I'm the last one um, and I started my schooling like starting from my uh, mom's school like you know the lower primary school that used to be one just two room in a very um, dilapidated hut kind of thing in the beginning. It used to be like uh, with bamboo, uh, you know, like bamboo and mud walls and then mm. some had holes and <laughs> and we used to bring this like, you know, 
bora that um, oh, fertilizer wow. sex. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's so funny that um, uh, I was supposed to go to a higher grade. Like I passed class two. It it is only up to class two there, and then I finished class two. And uh, the year I finished class two, like there was um. Uh, government construction for a new lower primary school and then um, there were benches and there were like toys to play for the kids etc so some because of some government initiative so I decided to stay back <laughs> to the school in the school and I did another year of schooling in there um, and because it was a bad construction because of a storm everything was broken again like mm. it all was like yeah rushed like everything was flattened so that's uh, how I started my education. Then I went to Tiny Tots Unique School in Fal, uh, Dulalen, and then I did. Uh, I started only up to class five there, class five six. Uh, while I was at class six, I set for an entrance examination for the uh, JNV Jawahar Navodaya Vidyalaya, and at that time, Imphal was one district. It wasn't divided into Imphal East and Imphal West. So I went uh, for. I set for the exam, and I got through. Luckily, so I went to JNB Kumbong. Um, uh, it's for I think it's for Imphal West, West now. So Imphal East has also another Navodaya Vidyalaya, but the Kumbong I think was one of the oldest Navodayas in Imphal, and I spent such a great time there. Like so many good teachers that I can never forget, and I still write letters to them now, even though there are emails. I don't know why. Like there's a special attachment to writing letters. Yeah, like, of course. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. Writing. So, <laughs> yeah, I recently went to last year. I went to Mexico and. I remembered my history teacher talking about the Mayan civilization and the Incas and all those things. So I actually visited like s very old uh, sites for these civilizations, and I actually bought a Mayan calendar and sent him for Christ as a Christmas holiday, a Christmas gift. So I think he was very surprised to get a letter from a very grown <laughs> majority <laughs> woman. Uh, so and then I did study till class ten there, and after class ten. Um, I went to uh, Delhi, New Delhi, and I did my uh, plus one and plus two from there, 11 and 12 standards. Uh, it's um, Queen Mary Senior Secondary School. Mm -hmm. And after that, um, after passing off uh, 12 class, I stayed back in Delhi and went to Hansraj College and did physics honors. So I spent three years in Hansraj College. And after that, I studied a master's uh, MSc physics in DU. I stayed in one of the famous uh, girls hostels, PG women's hostel in Delhi. Like the Pratha is very famous there. So I used yeah, to Yeah, no, no. I used to visit that uh, ah, hostel okay. when my sister was there. And going to ah, all right. my sister also did uh, physics from Miranda oh, College awesome. and then, you know, in the university. Yeah, and I love that yeah. Pratha. And <laughs> I would say word. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that I actually uh, got admitted to Miranda House as well, but I don't yeah. know, somehow I was always um, in, uh, I was just coming out of a girls only school and I was a bit fed up. Of, of <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I was always in a co ed, like co educational institute, like Dying Tots Unisco. Jawahar Navode Vidyalaya, and then I went to Queen Queen Mary Senior Secondary School, and for two years it was uh it was just a girls' school, and I just don't know like I don't know like I just felt that like no I'm if I'm go to Miranda House it's gonna be another three years of only girls, and <laughs> I, yeah, and so I decided that I'll go to Hansraj College, and so yeah. and uh, fortunately that's where I met my my husband as well so it turned out okay. well for so me like yes <laughs> yes destiny um and i spent uh, two years in uh, doing my msc i finished my msc and at the end of my uh like i just i had just finished my first year masters and i gave an entrance test for uh, doing a phd like uh, the junior research fellowship thing is there like which is which people used to call as the net exam or something like that for getting into lecturership as well mm -hmm. so i got that and my plan was just to stay in india do a phd and then give many um, exams you know like for banks or for any government jobs that's that's what a girl from a village like Kundrakpam would <laughs> tend to dream about, like as in getting a government job and having a good life, have, giving, getting a good salary as a source of income is what something I had dreamt about. And my parents, obviously, like it's very common in, in, in Imphal to 
think of their child as a future IS officer. So it's um, it it's like it, that was the common dream, like for many people, as also for my parents as well. But I was always very interested in doing uh, science in, especially in physics, and I think that's because. You know, you can see the stars, the moon, everything is very real in physics. Mm -hmm. It's very, uh, it's present in you, like it's present around you, like the, the many physical phenomena. So I was always very interested in that. So at the last semester of my MSc, I um, went and gave, um, gave an interview. There were like seven professors from DU, I think St. Stephen's College and other colleges as well. And that interview i didn't even know properly about like what is the outcome of the interview going to be but um i was very lucky one of my friends who used to be in st stephen's at the time she said that she doesn't want to go and give the interview by herself so she said that why don't you come and give the interview with me and i said yeah why not and then so i borrowed money for the application <laughs> which was 200 rupees at that time and uh I went and gave the interview and uh, it was very um it was very surreal as in like they asked me questions repeatedly many times like mm -hmm. what is the Fourier transform of sine x <laughs> it's like very physics and maths but <laughs> it's the same question they will ask me again in the in the beginning of the interview and at the end of the interview it's like in the middle of the interview the same question I don't know mm -hmm. why and then uh, they were supposed to select like five students from all over India. And so they were not satisfied with the quality of the students. And so they selected only three. And luckily, I was one of them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, I interacted with a lot of uh, uh, professors from DU at that time, like who were in the panel. And they were um, obviously I was very nervous and very scared. It was very scary because I was just finishing my master's and there were all these big professors asking me all these questions. But somehow i managed to get it and that was a scholarship to the us without even giving toefl without giving gre you know the drill when you mm -hmm. want to go to US, us university you are supposed to give all this proficiency in english language and then you are supposed to give this gre exam and then you apply to 10 universities and then you keep your fingers crossed that you get through in one so mm -hmm. it is a very expensive process like even though the uh, application fees is only hundred dollars, but if you convert it in Indian rupees, it was a huge sum at that time. And even for giving GRE, it was 10,000 rupees. I don't know how much it is now, but at the time it was 10,000 rupees. And for giving TOEFL for the English proficiency, I just didn't have that kind of money at the time. But mm -hmm. somehow it was offered on a platter and uh, they said that you're going to be trained uh, in St. Stephen's College and Mathematical Sciences Foundation for six months and after that you are off to the US uh, for a scholarship for doing your MS and PhD and I was everyone was a bit skeptical like even my friends like are you sure what university is this and some people were like ah, I don't think this is a good university it's a fake university or you know like all, all those because things. Because they couldn't and, believe that you just got it without you know yeah, but the process. My friend, yes my friend who invited me um, to come along with her her name is Amrita she and I bought got it. So mm -hmm. we were That's and amazing. bought it. Yes, it yeah. was wonderful. <laughs> wow. And we went together on the same day and we stayed as roommates for four years while I was doing my PhD and uh, before I moved to Australia. So that was a very difficult part in my life because it, all my sisters are in Imphal. They, have, they didn't go out of Imphal to study. I was the first one to step out of the state to study and now I'm going far away. So. Mm. It's like uh, for them, I don't think they had ever thought that I had dreams about going, even though I had dreams about going, but I didn't have the means. So I didn't really talk much That's about it. it. Yes, yes. I, but deep down below, I think there was always this, this desire to actually go and do research. But um, it's like I said, just, there was no means at all. And I quite, I'm quite practical as well. So what what's the point of doing things that, dreaming things that is beyond reality so that was something that i never pursued but yeah like i think like i just got lucky and uh, maybe like god heard my <laughs> inner feelings 
<laughs> and so something came along the way. But uh, the very important thing is that uh, I just took up the opportunity that was laid out in front of me. Mm -hmm. And there was this unknown future for me as well. The unknown future was that I could have taken that junior research fellowship I had cleared in uh, at the end of my first year master's. I give it for just, um, you know, just like that, as in, Obviously, I studied for the exam, but I wasn't really sure that whether you'll get it in the first go. But luckily, I got that. And I was so thankful to God at the time because uh, I was always getting money from home. And when your parents are retired, it's really hard to ask for money all the time. And that was a really difficult time and it was very painful to ask them for money and sometimes uh you know sometimes what they send is not enough then at that time i used to like coach uh when i was in second year masters i used to teach computer science to first year master students and earn tuition money and then like mm -hmm. and do whatever i want with that um so the it, it was a big um I wouldn't say like fight. It was an argument with the family as well that whether I should be allowed to go to the US or not. Mm. So at that time, I was like, what do you mean by allowed? I am an mm. adult. I am um, I'm someone who is finishing my master's right now. I can make my own decisions. And that was something that I think is quite um, at that time, like I think it's a more a lot more common this, these days but uh you know females like taking their own decisions like you know in a big mm. family you they always like oh what and is your dad say about too. yes and so what is your sister going to say about this as in like you know they want to listen to everyone about mm. my future but i said that my future is for me so you know like i appreciate all the love and all the support but uh you know t t there's no question about you letting me go it's about like whether I want to go or not. So I am not taking permission. I am taking your blessings. So it was it was a huge fight. I cried over the phone like every day, I think. And I failed all, all my last semester exam papers because of that. I was crying all the time and I was not studying at all. Mm -hmm. So, but because do you had this uh, wonderful system that if you had... Um, pass your previous subjects. So they were not che checking at the individual scores, they were checking at the overall scores. But because I had done very, very well, exceptionally well in my uh, practical exams and I had scored very well. So I still got a first class in uh, master's, but I failed all my three subjects in my last semester. That was horrible. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was the first time I failed in a class. And uh, yeah, so, but that was, that is all history now. It's all good. And after that, um, I went to Singapore for a two month internship at the National University of Singapore. And I think that was the time I decided that, okay, this is it. I am going for research and uh, no one's gonna stop me from now because first of all, I'm so tired of taking parents from uh, money from my parents because they're very old and they can't support me anymore. And if I go to the US, I'm getting my stipend and I am on a track for my research. Whereas if I stay back in India, take up my junior research fellowship, and I am going to be working with a professor or someone in anywhere in India, and then I don't, well, I could, it's still research, but the expectation was that I am going to give like uh, entrance tests for civil service examinations or any other sort of examinations for bank POs or whatever. So I, I thought that this is, a, this is a, this is, one line I can go, but it's not very sure what am I going to end up doing, whether I'm going to do a half cook PhD and then I'm not going to clear the entrance exams as well. So I wasn't really sure, but what was sure to me at the time is that if I go for my PhD, I will be, I will, I, I have the chance to become an expert in something. So mm -hmm. I decided that intuitions, what said the best to me at that time, that this is a future that is more solid for you. So I just, I just believed that and I just took on it and I just fought or argued with everyone and tried to convince everyone who came along the way. And I also like have to be grateful to, uh, like you said, to whom am I grateful to? There were even school seniors who studied in Navode Vidya, like they sent me money. I haven't met them even after class 10 and I haven't met them even now. And they sent me money to help me go to the US. Like what a great, great soul. <laughs> You know, yeah. like I, yeah, and we used to chat because, like, there at the time, Orkut was Orkut doesn't mm. does no longer exist now, but it was there, and <laughs> that was before <laughs> the Facebook time. 
exactly and one of the uh, one of the uh, my we call them brothers and sisters are seniors in navodia and one of the brother actually sent me money and then that was very helpful and very very kind and obviously after going to the us i paid back not in one go but you know like after whenever i get my stipend it used to be every month 100 dollars or something like that and i repaid everything but what a great soul i mean mm-hmm. it was it was such a tough time for me and you know they they were already working so they were very very generous yeah, yeah. i'm thankful to them yeah yeah and and so finished my phd finished my masters in 2 years and after that finished my phd in another 2 years and then i went to uh give an interview and uh, got a job in university of queensland in a very in a very popular and renowned laboratory led by two two famous scientists in my area and so i got a job for 3 years there and then after that i got a fellowship to join uh, qut queensland university of technology and once at the end of that fellowship i gave an interview for to become a part of the faculty uh, so that's when i got this lectureship position so as a junior academic junior faculty member and it's been one year one and a half one and a half, one year one almost one and a half years and i'm really enjoying it wow cool what a story <laughs> of how yeah, you know you yeah. came from manipur delhi yeah. us singapore and then to australia yeah so it's like uh, yeah i have lived in different continents and it's been a great experience and because of my job uh, i have to travel quite a bit not every month but at least once or twice in a year to go to conferences and interact with collaborators and also give presentations about the kind of work that we are doing in my lab or in qt as well so mm-hmm. i have to travel to europe or i have to go to back to the us and m- more than not like it's um us that i go to for the conferences but sometimes it takes me to europe as well then uh, next month i'm going to singapore to present uh, at a conference so it's uh, traveling is fun and this kind of profession also supports gives us the opportunity and the avenues to travel as well yeah, yeah absolutely all right so i didn't want to interrupt in between but i had written sorry a long blurb about no, no, me no 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 that's good i wanted to um i guess follow up on a couple of things you said right um, sure. one of the thing is in one of the interview you said you know the panelist was asking the question the same question in the middle in the beginning in the end did you find out why they were asking or was it like a oh yeah one of the professor said at the end so um one professor they were different professors who asked the same question I and see. then yeah and so in the beginning yeah, they said like okay uh, take this and then draw it on the board and then so i don't know whether it was a white board or a black board at the time and i was drawing it and then t- at the end they asked some similar related questions and then i said uh, yeah this the, the fourier transform of sin x is sin x and then they were like draw it on the board and so this was the same question i have to draw it on the board and then when i draw it on the board it was like uh, i had just done only like it's you're supposed to get both positive and negative numbers when you draw this mm-hmm. diagram but i was drawing only on the positive side and then um so that was in the middle and then at last um he asked me they asked several questions in between and then one person one of the professor asked me again so what is the fourier transform of sin x again and then i said this and this is the fourier transform of sin x and he said uh, but then your drawing is it correct and i said oh yes it should have negative numbers as well and so i went and did that and mm-hmm. I, so the first professor who asked me said that uh, I have already asked a question what did you ask again and then he, he the last one said oh i was just checking her confidence <laughs> also i guess that, you know maybe if they didn't get the full answer and they wanted to know you know like okay yes. so that was interesting yeah she right. said, he said no i was just checking her confidence she, she was a dead confident <laughs> in the beginning and i was like okay <laughs> it's like yeah. if you are asking the same question and again and again maybe you will start thinking did i answer it wrong should i change my answer yeah yeah, yeah maybe <laughs> that's yeah. interesting so again you mentioned couple of times your um grat- gratefulness to god do you mind yeah. sharing like what is your ritual what do you you know oh my god because you seem that's... to be very grounded and i think it would be nice to share with our listeners on you know oh, thanks for that question so um 
I, I was very fortunate in that um, I was introduced to spirituality like in a very early age. So when um, I was in class five or six, I don't even remember the actual time, but that time, like my dad had started singing in uh, not as a profession, but, you know, they used to have this group of retired, uh, semi-retired people. And they used to sing like bhajans, like Hare Krishna bhajans. Mm. So they okay. used to have this yeah, Sankritan every Thursday or they used to rotate it like once in my house and then they will go to uh, somebody else's house. And then like uh, my, one of my dad's very close friend, friend is called like Haigruzam <laughs> Ozaibobi. Mm-hmm. They used to go to his house and he used to sing a lot and uh, they used to sing like that. Even my, our neighbor was... Uh, who has passed away, but uh, he and our dad were like of similar ages, and they used to sing like you know you know the kortan kya bolte mm. like what was that mm. thing that they used to do uh, with that brass thing like, mm-hmm. and I used to have one for myself, and okay. whenever like we used to. Um, have this like I would participate it very religiously as in very eagerly I would I used to sing with them and sit with them and sing and so it used to be Krishna bhajans it used to my dad is a uh, Vaishnav so mm. and we were uh, we like going to ISKCON we were uh, watching Ras Lila and all these things and so I was very uh, into it in mm. in the very early years of my life i was singing nimai sanyas and all these uh, very popular uh, he lanba and all those things songs and i used to be more attached to those songs instead of the mainstream hindu hindi hindi songs and the english songs like my friend would sing like uh, you know um, uh, what those english bands at that time mm. uh, those english songs and i wouldn't be able to understand. Obviously, the accent is also so different, and I used to feel like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but I still remember, like you know, my friends used to sing like these uh, uh, English songs, like uh, sang by like you know very uh, eminent bands all over the world. But I never used to get all those things. Like, uh, neither was my inclination. So I I sang only bhajans most of the time, and then so that was my meditation so the without real. Is in my Taylor. Or in uh, and Bengali as well, like because in Manipur, like uh, Hare Krishna s- system was introduced by a Bengali, right? So okay. that's, yeah, so it's, there are uh, Bengali bhajans as well, without knowing people <laughs> sell it as Sanskrit. I see. In, yeah, but uh, later on, I realized that it's not Sanskrit, it's Bengali. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, that, and then at that time, there was also the rise of Sai Baba in Satya Sai Baba in Imphal. Uh, so Satya Sai Baba is uh, in Bangalore. He's passed away, but uh, it's that message of him spread around Imphal at that time. So in very like in corners of Imphal, there used to be like uh, popular bhajans, Sai bhajans every Thursday, mm-hmm. um, and it, and it was very regulated. That was something I like about. There has to be twelve songs, and then the songs has to be the bhajans has to be only four lines. You have to repeat it only twice, or it was very the bhajan is over in one hour, and mm-hmm. uh, without knowing like what is actually happening to me, I was really drawn into it. Like and I was singing bhajans all the time and it was a sort of meditation. I, I only realize now that that was meditation, yeah. that when you're singing, when you are totally absorbed into that, you have forgotten everything what's happening. And so I used to have this belief in myself that if I do well, like no one can question me. This is so funny. This is what, what of my one of my sisters said to me that, like, you know, if I'm being naughty, but if I'm doing well in school, no one will scold me. This is what my mm-hmm. sister said. And so I, what I used to pray to God was that, please make me do well so that I can be naughty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if you're doing well in your studies, which is the main value for your family and your parents, then, you know, they yes. kind of like, okay. Yeah, so let, let me go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's what I used to pray to God all the time. Please make me do well. And at that time, my father said to me that, you know, the way you pray to God when you are, uh, sometimes you pray in the wrong way. I said, what do you mean? Don't pray that you want to come first in class. Don't pray mm-hmm. that you want to be beautiful. Don't pray that, don't pray for all these materialistic things. Mm-hmm. And I said, so what should I pray for? I was quite young, like class <laughs> five, six. And he said to that, he said to me, my dad, like uh, my dad, by the way, like is uh 
still alive, but he's in a different world now. He has yeah. um, um, old age dementia, so he doesn't remember all these things that I'm saying. But mm -hmm. uh, so at that time, he said that to me that, um, you know, you should be praying that please help me in becoming a better servant of you. Mm -hmm. And I said, what does that mean? Better servant of God. He said, better servant of God means you, it is like an all round development that even if you're very rich, but if you're very sick, then how can you be a servant of God? Mm. And then even if you're doing very well in life, but if you are incapacitated in some sort of way, then how can you serve people? Mm -hmm. So having like praying this in this way that be let me be a better servant of you, like in, incorporates everything that you know, you need to exist in life, like mm -hmm. being happy, being well, being healthy, being having enough for yourself and to be able to help other people. So till this day, when I pray to God, if I am praying about something, then if I say, if something comes up in my mind, I feel that I am not being good. I feel that I should be praying in this way that let me be a better servant. So even if I'm frustrated and if I'm not able to concentrate in this article that I'm writing or I'm solving some tutorials for the class and I'm not able to get the right answer that I want to say to the students, it leads to frustration. But when, once I like turn towards like God or singing, trying to listen to a bhajan and meditate, all I can come up to think is that, can you please make me a better servant of you? So I that's think so that's very ingrained. Yeah. yeah, that's very ingrained in my body, like in my mind and soul from a very childhood. And I remember like um, when I was in Navodaya Vidyale, like my mom used to cut me these small candles mm. and uh, so that I can burn a small candle mm. every day. So, and she used to pack all these packets of candles to last me the entire like three, four months that I'll be away and Agarbati. And mm -hmm. uh, I do that every day. Like, and we used to have bunk beds in Navode. And so one of my teacher, like with the, to whom I am very grateful to this day, she, uh, I think saw me like doing that. And she's also quite like religious and as in spiritual and pray a lot. Mm -hmm. And she saw me doing that, but then everything is like, yeah, I'm doing that on my bed. Mm. And then she said to me that uh, so one day that, hey, can you put that on top of your mirror so that if things fall, it doesn't burn? Mm -hmm. She was giving me a better way how to do it. So she said that, can you have a broad mirror to for yourself? So put it, put the agarbati and the candle on top of the mirror when you go to class so that, you know, mm. everything is safe. So mm. I was very, very encouraged instead of saying that, hey, don't do that. That's the, you know, you're going to burn the entire house, house down or something like that. She kind of found a better way for me better to actually. Way and stay. Yeah. And to, to, like, you know, still help me do the things that I want to do. So mm -hmm. I was like, uh, at the time I was speaking very like um, openly about Sai Baba. And then, you know, a lot of people used to come and ask for the Bibhuti, the Mm -hmm. ashes that Sai Baba gives out and puts on your on your like uh, put on your forehead so I used to have that quite a bit and everyone would come and then when they're stressed or something and uh, they used to say that oh I'm going for an exam can you just like you know put give me a little bit and they used to feel like <laughs> good about <laughs> it <laughs> and I was also feeling good I'm spreading good messages about like about him but mm -hmm. I don't know whether it was good or bad but that's how mm -hmm. like I spent my uh, childhood like being very oriented towards spirituality Okay, so your yeah. offering of light and incense stick was more in the mornings, or did you yes, do both in the mornings, mornings and evening? Evenings, I didn't do the candle, but mm -hmm. I used to do still do an agarbati. But in the morning before class, I used to pray every day, just okay. to help make me a better servant of you every day. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, interesting. Yeah, and I think that kept me very, very grounded. Uh, yeah, and I felt. Yeah. I felt that it's not about religion, it's about discipline and having uh, uh, having a, this routine that gives you even for two seconds something to bring your focus back. Like even if mm -hmm. I'm like angry or if I'm like, you know, frustrated or if I'm worried or sad, like that two seconds or that 30 seconds when I'm doing this and help me a better, be a better servant, that's like something that you bring all your focus in that moment and you like reorganize after that. So I think that more than religion, it was something that I don't know how to describe, but that helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I mean, it's very interesting for me to uh, listen, you know, what drives somebody, you know, so <laughs> yeah. much of strength, because you spoke about, um, you know, your voice and fighting back 
into what you want, right, during the late yes. phases of your studies? And yes. um, what inspired you or what do you think attributed to your strong voice and knowing that, no, this is what I need to do. Why should I be taking permission from you? This is, you know, my life. And in a way, I do want to follow, you know, what I'm aspired to. So can yeah. you elaborate and share a little bit on your um sure um, strength because so, i think like many of us right face that situation and i know that parents are saying the best for their children but um i just want to talk more about it so that i think uh, both the parents and the uh, children community would kind of you know understand yes and i guess talk more about this issue which people don't talk much yes um you know parents try to do the best for you but sometimes they don't make the best decisions for you and that is not applicable to every situation every situation is different say in my case like i was like you know getting, having your master's degree is like you know someone old enough to get married and start a family that means like you're considered matured at that time and I just felt at that time that, uh, you know, my parents, as, anyways, I was the last daughter and I was born when my mom was 50 or nearly 50. And there was a huge generation gap. So mm -hmm. when I'm in my 20s, my mom is in my 70s. So it's like, you know, the, the, the era that they grew up and the, their expectations that they had, like it was... Uh, it was not very well aligned with some of my thinking at that time. And mm -hmm. also because I was not at home, I was uh, away, I was interacting with a lot more people at that time. So it's, it's, it was, I was more open to a lot of ideas. Like, whereas people, if you just interact with one set of surrounding, if you just interact with your immediate people or just your, you, you are not going anywhere outside, you are just there, then you observe only what is good for that surrounding. You observe only what is accepted in that surrounding. You are not, I'm not saying you are a bad person, but you are not open to a lot of ideas. But as you travel, as you move around, I think uh, as I have traveled around the world now, I have become a lot more accepting. At that time, there was good things comes in packages. Like if you got, uh, wake up early in the morning, then you're a good person. If you sleep till noon, you're a bad person. Like everything used to be in packages. And <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I had started fighting that norm a little bit. What yeah. if I was spending the entire night, like, you know, working on this presentation that was really critical and I just wanted to finish it. And so that's why I'm sleeping late. So I had uh, started questioning the norms a little bit at the time. And I had also started like uh, thinking about what is actually good and what is actually bad. It used to be so black and white in the house. And I had all started exploring the shades of gray a little bit. And so I guess like at that time, I wanted to take my future in my own hands and I was not very happy not being able to decide what I want to do. So that was the one most uh, foremost thing. Second was that um, my parents like were, were just aware about, you know, what you become after doing after your studies just as a doctor, engineer, or you can become a college uh, lecturer or you can go to university and become a professor. But they don't really know all the other kind of professions that exist outside of that. Mm -hmm. So there was, uh, I guess, like ignorance from their side because of the generation gap. And then there is, um, um, for me, I wanted to explore more. And I also felt that at that time, because they have given me enough strength to do, to know what is good for me and what is bad. And I was mature enough to take my own decision. And I felt really, I know they were doing everything for, for to what they think is good for me, but I felt very insulted that I cannot take my own, my own career in my own hands. Like, you know, like this is a thing I want to do and you are, and I know myself that I want to do this and you are pushing me towards in other direction, then what is the whole purpose of educating me and bringing me up to this stage where, to a stage where I can decide for myself, like what is good and what is bad and then taking away everything back, like, you know, no, this is not yeah. good You have to do this. So I felt that it is a very um, delicate situation as well. Like 
I, I, I didn't want to make them feel bad, but, uh, but if I had to follow what I want to do, it w- the outcome was that they're going to feel bad. Mm-hmm. And so, but I just, I was like, just to help me, like I, I obviously I was praying that I, I, this is my form of meditation. And I said, that just help me be a better servant and please guide my thoughts in a way that is good for me. And so I guess uh, that just helped me like get the strength. Like uh, sometimes when I'm very sad or very like feeling very down and out, I do meditate by singing bhajans, like listening to bhajans that I grew up with. And that gives me a lot of strength. And at that time, I think uh, that was what was required to give me the strength. And also I knew that I would have a better future at that uh, in going to the US and get becoming an expert in an area. And I wasn't really sure that what exam I'm going to give. Obviously, they wanted me to go to civil service and give civil service examinations, but they also wanted me to give every possible exam. It's just like multiplying, uh, you know, your opportunities. But at the same time, nothing was focused. And mm. also, I have heard about stories that you know you have you you, you go in with all the good intention and with all the uh, focus to for giving for administrative service examinations, but sometimes it's just not your capability. There's always a chance of luck, like you know five percent or two percent, whatever it is. So what if it doesn't work out? It is going to be like it was so expensive and like I said finance was a problem and they were like oh we have so much property like you know we're going to sell this for, and then we'll pay for your tuitions and things but that is so such a big responsibility on my shoulder at that time and for something that is for which we do not know the outcome and at the time some of my family members remarked that oh you're not confident that you will clear the exam that's why you're taking the easy way out <laughs> and oh my that god that made you so mad <laughs> Yes. And I said that then I am going now I'm taking my destiny in my own hands. And so don't you dare say a word. I am not going to take a penny from you. If you don't want to give me money, that's fine. That's so and funny. I, you know, I, it's like, and the, I think it went like looking back now, I find it like quite funny and like something which I have said might not be really in out of context, but uh, or something not right. But at that time, that's what I felt is right. But it, yeah, I, I just I just don't know what happened at the time. Like it's there was just drive in me to be independent, to be not able to ask for every single bit of money to do everything. I think at a, after a certain age, you start feeling guilty about a lot of things. Yeah. And I felt that if I, if I, if my dad sells all the land and all everything that he has, and just out of something, if does something doesn't work out, even in spite of my 100% efforts, then what's going to happen? So I was being more practical, I think, in my mind, like yeah. that I was taking something up that is more sure, something I like, and just going going with towards that with full throttle. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I mean, I, I like to talk about this because like you said, it's with the good intent, right, from your family, yeah. because that's yes. what they know, right? That's what they know. They know exactly. about the exam, people have done yeah. this, but they don't know about the other world, which you have seen. And exactly. it's about giving yes. space to you and, you know, yes. to other people who have similar situation. Yeah. And uh, funny, like, you know, uh, when I went home this time, there was a little boy that I talked to because his mom was really, uh, really eager for him to talk to me. And I just had gone for a to give some, uh, you know, some gift to a wedding. And he was there and he said that I said, uh, so what do you want to do when you grow up? What are you interested in? And he said, I want to be an IS officer. And I said to him that what does an IS officer do? And Obviously, he could not answer that <laughs> because yeah. it's what the parents have said. And yep. I said, whether the parents like it or not, I said to in front of the mom that, look, you're very, very young. You are in class four. So don't decide what you want to do right now. It's good to have it's good to be very ambitious. But, you know, sometimes you should do what you like. And what subject are you interested in? And he said that I'm very fond of mathematics. I said, then you should strive to become a mathematician. You know, they're really good. Like mathematics solves a lot of problems. <laughs> and so it, I just told, I just tried to instill in his mind that, you know, you, you're too young. You don't decide, don't get fixated. 
there's a whole wide world that you don't know about that you might find it really more interesting and so and then the mother was sitting at the side and uh, like she changed her tone at the end but you know like <laughs> she, was not, she was not very happy then <laughs> She yeah maybe not yeah bit. sometimes i say to kids like oh it's okay don't come in first in class just enjoy life and they yeah. parents don't really like me saying that like when i say it's okay not to f- come first in class and that's because my parents have always told me that oh you cannot come first in class this was something that i just don't like it when parents compare you to other kids and i know that this was done all with good intention and all with you know the people there are different like moms around the world different parents and they are of different like exposure to the world and they bring up their child in a way they think is best for them and so like but in in my family my mom had always compared me to a lot of other kids mm. like compared like oh uske bacche to like you know she's come first in class like me ma chaati hai mane first star nang jina ba ba we hangat nam da gai thar ta ho ba it's 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 it hurts and yeah. as, as a child no, you know no, how to express but really i i mean thank you for speaking out so candidly because in our community i feel we don't speak out and it's no, not just the bad intent that we are speaking out but i think we do need to fill that gap that yeah hey, and i know? tell all my sisters <laughs> now that you have to say that to your kids that do your best do your best Mm-hmm. don't care about the results like do your best go and is this the best you can get like you have got like you know 16 out of maths i think you're a lot more intelligent than this so you know like try try work harder say things like that don't say come first in class mm. it's it's the wrong way the, the the focus should be on the not the outcome the focus should be like whether the child is learning the maths or whether the child is doing well giving her best efforts in or and getting a good result out of it not coming for first in class maybe even if you score 50% you may come first in class you know yeah. like yeah so i think the focus was totally wrong but like this this makes me feel a bit bad speaking about this very candidly but whatever like a drive they had instilled in me that whether like to come first in class or whatever that has made me what i am today like i'm able to stand on my own feet and earn my own living and mm-hmm. uh, have a independent life and go around the world and talk to people see explore everything but i felt that i had no um outlet for the hurt that i felt at that time because right. if i cry like if i feel too emotional I don't think being emotional is too supported at least in my family like you know uh, I just I just didn't have any avenues of expressing my mm-hmm. what I felt at the time as a child and I I feel very unfortunate that I was I didn't have the courage that or I didn't feel uh it was appropriate that I could express this to my mom so yeah you know every, yeah. every no yeah and i think like it's traditionally when i when i said right thank you for sharing so candidly just because we are sharing this doesn't mean that yeah. you don't love your mom you love your mom oh, yeah, i know I, that yes, so course. but what i'm trying to convey and you know share with people is hey you know we can have difference of opinion and i think we yes. should be able to express that but by sharing that doesn't mean that hey you know i'm talking badly about my mom or my dad or my family <laughs> yeah. so i just want to encourage that sharing because like you said like as a little girl right imagine the way you had like carrying that thought about being compared and not being able to tell to anybody right so yeah, yes <laughs> it's it's really it's really bad and like i just tell to like i have a lot of niece and nephews now like because i am the youngest like, me and my sister have a 13 year gap in between so mm-hmm. she's she has like kids that is uh in like uh, college or in uh, finishing 12th class and i mean th- th- by god's grace they're also very good students but i tell them that don't you dare go and tell your tell your child that you know you're not good enough Mm. <laughs> you know yeah. that's not good you, yeah. you should make them like feel that you are uh, you are the person they can come to to share any insecurities in their life but if you say that oh you're not good in a look like other people's kids are like this how will they ever feel like confident to or open to come and share these things to you and then they'll go and share with someone else then you'll feel bad about it <laughs> yeah and i think you know we should learn to accept that everyone is unique and special and they have their own you know 
uh, yes. gift to where they could excel and it may not be like excelling in the norm what is being said by the society so yeah thank you for sharing that so another You're thing right. i think what you mentioned is the intuition so it looks like in your case right many mm-hmm. things you are grounded and your ritual seems to kind of internalize yourself in knowing exactly what you want and you follow that right <laughs> So yeah you more or less a little bit about intu- intuition Yeah sometimes like um I feel that as I grow up now I can say as I grow older I'm not growing up anymore <laughs> but uh as time passes I feel that uh, I should not do what people say like no you should do it this way just because someone is saying it this way uh it would say even for in my job or in my personal life when someone says like uh oh no no you should do it this way then i feel that uh by following someone's steps i haven't actually traveled that path and i am not learning much i am not exploring much and eventually i end up doing what i thought i should be doing so it's very very strong in me like the intuition is like if i don't want to do something i should not do it because if i am just following what other people or someone has said do it this way because this has worked out for them then it's like i am following someone's path and i'm not giving myself the opportunity to uh learn i may fail or i may be successful in the path that i've chosen but until and unless i check it out whether what i had thought is actually right or wrong then i am not actually using my brain enough like i'm i am gifted with a brain it's mm-hmm. everyone has a brain so i think they should be able to take decisions if they can mm-hmm. and that decision i think it uh, obviously if you tell this to a child like you take your own decision that is absolutely useless but as as in a profession now uh and when i am um uh like taking leadership role and when i am like leading a lot of uh, students now to do better and to learn like physics or to do research then i feel that i don't want to just do something that someone has said that this works mm-hmm. and and this is very important for someone in research because uh, half of the time what we are studying is unknown because it is new let's say if i'm doing if i'm doing class eight physics or nine physics or even undergrad physics it's very it has a definite answer to everything say or calculate the weight for this you know mass which is a, which is object which is a mass of this and what is the force of gravity acting on it or whatever so i'm giving too many examples of physics but that's um something you have a definite answer for it but at this point in my life like and in a lot of real situations also uh that you don't have a definite answer and also when i'm doing physics right now when i'm doing my research it doesn't have a definite answer you are trying to form uh you are trying to form a very um well informed like opinion about what is happening from by observing the surroundings or by doing your experiments or and then you have a strong intuition that this might be what is happening so mm-hmm. i maybe it's because of my profession that i need to be taking independent uh decisions or very well informed decisions that i am following intuition a lot more these days if someone says like or oh, do this or oh, they you know they have like been uh suffering a lot so can you just provide something with this or something i i i don't want to do that i just want to follow my intuition and i want to know more about what is happening and then i want mm-hmm. to decide for myself so it's it's i don't know it's a, intuition is a really strong thing in me and uh, i think the intuition gets stronger with experience i think right. intuition was something that was not existent in uh in my childhood like but it's like with slowly it's growing into me that if i say if i'm interacting with my phd student and some there is some issues that has cropped up obviously it's you know the world is full of problems so, so you just how to know you just should know how to navigate it and so if i have an issue with my phd student and if some my of my colleagues say that oh i have in this situation i have done like this and it was resolved i don't want to do that mm-hmm. i probably want to do it my way the thing the way that i feel is uh 
is good or the way I'm more comfortable with. And yes, this is one important thing that if you're following in your intuition, you're more comfortable in what you're doing. You're more confident right. in what you're doing. But if you're following someone's route or what someone says, then it's like when something happens and you're like, oh, this is what that person said. Because you're not really aware about what you're doing. You're just following something. So intuition has become... <laughs> very very strong and very propelling sometimes like annoying as well so <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's very interesting because intuition is something again like which i'm working on and i think like you said right the more you listen to yourself i think your intuition become more stronger yeah and so yeah. there are certain things that like you know people say oh don't talk about it you know don't talk about it because yeah. people feel bad about it or whatever it is but I want to talk about it. It's happening yeah. in my life. And yeah. I want to share this. And people will be like, oh, no, no, we don't talk about these things. Like, you know, then they will be, it's like, but why? Like, you know, you don't talk about it because you don't want to talk about it. But I want to talk about it. So I should be following my intuitions and I should be sharing things that I want to share. So I don't know. It's it's a, it's very, it's a very fine line to walk the line, like between uh, mm -hmm. adjusting to surroundings and also like being living in a society where you don't you're not hurting people or you're saying only the right things but then doing so sometimes you're not standing up for yourself if you're always trying to say things that what people appreciate <laughs> then mm -hmm. sometimes I feel that you're not expressing fully yeah absolutely no oh, thank you for sharing that all right so um which batch did you pass out your tent like 2000 2000 okay all mm -hmm. right okay so before we go to our next segment is there anything else you want to share well the uh, yeah like thank you for this platform i have been following your um initiatives from a very from a very early obviously not from the very beginning but uh, uh, when you started getting popular on facebook and all then i have been looking like what you're doing and etc so because it's nice to know about people around the world that where we exist and all i think one of your first interview was uh, uh inambem like samita ngangom like uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, lady with a successful chain of like stores yeah. in the USA. And I like I think like I saw her interview and then I was like, this is a really great platform to uh, let people know about, you know, what is happening and what you want, what one can do with, uh, you know, with the skills that you have. And also I have seen all your projects and I think they are very uh, you're very generous for you with your time like I, I told this to uh, your mom as well that how does Monica manages everything in spite of having a very busy professional life and she, she told me that if you think you can you can I said and Monica is, <laughs> Monica is a living example of that <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for doing this because I know how hard it can be. You are a mom, you are a professional, and you have a very strong family life as well. So, you know, thanks for finding the time. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, for me, um, I think because I'm really passionate about what I do, it actually makes me more productive in my other facet of life. That's the way I take it. Because this that's, brings yeah, that's me right. so much of positivity that, you know, yes, I am yes, so productive and all, you know. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So, um, I think we are going to take a quick break, um, you know, before we go to the second segment of our gratitude project. Um, okay, sure. And then we will come back um, to hear about uh, the nomination of Sonia, like, you know, who she is going to be nominating for Thagachari. And before we sign off, I just want to share to everyone, I have printed this. Look at this. Okay, let me. Okay, there you go. So this are the new card for 1001 Thagachari. And um, I'm going to be uh, sending this and giving it to all the participants so that they can share this to their first nomination at the personal level. Um, so don't go away. Tune back in for the second session. 